Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us today for um, this year's Abraham Conference. Um, may I first, my name is Jane Jeffs. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the organizing committee, but may I first um, invite Auntie Shirley Gilbert to, um, to welcome us to country. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Jane. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, First of all, we'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and our young leaders who are emerging. These elders who have given us time, knowledge, guidance and strength to continue our traditions. I would also like to acknowledge and show appreciation to the many Aboriginal role models, those women who have shaped my life in particular. It is their rich contributions, resilience of sharing of spiritual traditions and generosity that make our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities strong. We as communities are committed to creating a genuine appreciation for the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their contributions to the workplace and to community. And in turn, we are working towards reconciliation, always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Um, I feel um, I want to also acknowledge today that I am here on Durrick lands um, in uh, what is now a little bit damp in Penrith. Um, and as a Gunditch Mara woman, I feel privileged to be able to live in peace and harmony on such beautiful lands. Also acknowledging that we are coming from many lands to share knowledge today. Many of you are from um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, communities and lands um, locally and from further afield, and some may even be from overseas. I would also like you to I'd like to welcome you to the conference titled Abraham Women Leaders in the Abrahamic Traditions Role Models for Our Time. The Abraham Conference continues to work together with our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to gain better understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures and the ongoing connection to land, water and seas, but also to spirituality. And I thank those special women role models in each of our communities. And listening today is an important thing from the three women speakers and to listen to their contributions they make every day to our families, to their mental health and wellbeing and to our spirituality, but most importantly, to acknowledge that these, without these women, we would not be the people we are today. I welcome all three women role models who will share with us their wisdom and hope as you listen deeply to their stories, which we call in our communities, the Deary, um, so that we can reflect on these women's understandings of their sacred texts and what they as role models for our time can share with us. Enjoy this online event. And I hope that the wisdom of all these women uh, is shared further afield today. Thank you. I believe we're now going to be um, welcomed to today by Abbas Alvi. Uh, thank you very much. Good
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I acknowledge my presence on Tharuk land, who are the original custodians of the land where I am based now in Western Sydney. I pay my respects to elders past and present and acknowledge the Aboriginal people for their custodianship on this land. Ms. Shirley Gilbert, distinguished speaker, Ms. Jackie Siemens, Ms. Michelle Tanoli, Ms. Yama Aga, Father Patrick McInerney, Chair of the SCOC and committee members of the Abraham Conference, Mr. Art Heeman, Ms. Kaki Howard, Father Shanuda Manzoor, Emirates Professor Rifat Ibed, Dr. Manas Ghosh, Ms. Kim Chong, Mr. Ahmed Polat, and Mr. Zay Ahmed. Religious leaders from different traditions, distinguished rabbis, priests, sheikhs, community leaders, educationalists, believers from the three Abrahamic religions, believers from other religions, non-believers, guests from Australia, as well as from different parts of the world who are connected with us now. On behalf of Abraham Conference Organizing Committee, I'm delighted to welcome you all to 2021 conference, Women Leaders in the Abrahamic Traditions, Role Model for Our Time. Religion has been an essential pillar in human history and has been instrumental in shaping cultures education, social fabrics, and our civilization. If we evaluate the influence of religion worldwide, 8% out of 10 are affiliated with the religious group. And it is estimated that 55% of world population follow Abrahamic religions. So this means that out of the total world population of 7.9 billion, almost 4.3 billion are believers of Abraham religions. And half of this, if we consider, then at least 2.2 billion are women. So whether or not the role and concept of women in three Abrahamic religions may have been explained differently, I shall not engage myself in the debate. However, the woman has been given exceptional importance and space by all three religions. Certainly our distinguished speakers shall explain to you their thoughts about women's leadership as role models of our time. I'm confident that the talk delivered by all three distinguished speakers from the perspective of different religious background will give you insightful information about commonality and differences about the importance of the leadership role of women in Abrahamic regions. Be respectful to women for they are the mothers of mankind. With these powerful words of Hazrat Imam Ali, I invite our ACOC member, Reverend Dr. Manas Ghosh, to introduce today's well-known and respected moderator, Ms. Jane Jeffries. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference. Thank you, Abbas. And I acknowledge the Guringai people of Teramaragal Band as the owner and custodian of this land where I am present. And I pay my respect to their elders past present and emerging and commit myself to work with them for reconciliation and peace. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Reverend Manus Ghosh. I'm the minister of St. John's Uniting Church in Urunga, Sydney, and I'm a member of the Abraham Conference Organizing Committee. It is my great pleasure to introduce Jane Jeffs, the moderator of Abraham Conference 2021. Jane is one of the most popular faces in film, TV, radio, online and print media for over 30 years. She was head of programs at leading UK independent unique broadcasting between 1990 and 2000, where she was responsible for developing and producing a wide range of daily, weekly, short-run series and one-off specials across a wide range of radio genres for BBC domestic and international networks and commercial radio. In Australia, she has developed, produced and directed a range of documentaries and successful TV formats through her own company, Firefly Productions, and for broadcasters, including ABC, SBS, Al Jazeera, and organizations such as the International Red Cross, New South Wales Law Society, 
and Unilever. She has produced shoots in India, China, Iran, Kenya, Hungary, the United States, the UK, and Australia on subjects ranging from women as victims of war and refugees. Her films such as Silma's School and Not Forgotten were screened internationally, including across the Muslim world and received significant media coverage. As the executive producer of ABC Religion and Ethics, during 2013 and 2017, Jen headed up the Australian Public Broadcasters Religion and Ethics Unit, dealing with the role of religion and faith-inspired individuals and organizations in the modern world. In 2018, in the newly created role of Communications and Impact Director for the G20 Interfaith Forum, Jane created a G20 anti-slavery task force to lobby the G20 to take more urgent action on modern slavery, forced labor, and human trafficking. In 2019, she co-founded War on Slavery, working closely with many dignitaries around the world. In early 2020, after the first COVID lockdowns were announced, Jane pivoted a TV proposal into a community project that saw her become a social and digital media producer and a finalist in the New South Wales Premier's Multicultural Communications Awards for best use of digital or social media. Jane is passionate proponent of greater diversity in the media. She gets the audiences to think about familiar things in new ways. She is also passionate about interfaith and cultural dialogue. In 2019, she received a Canterbury Bankstown Award for a contribution to interfaith dialogue and harmony in Australia. We are truly honored to have you, Jane, as the moderator of Abraham Conference 2021. And we cordially welcome you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manas. Um, gosh, I, I didn't expect um, you to tell the, tell everybody else so much about me, but thank, thank you very much. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the invitation from you all to, to chair this today or to MC this today. Um, I'm a mother of two girls. I'm a daughter of um, a mother who's one of two, a grandmother who was one of two, all girls. Um, and um, I have three sisters as well as a brother, but he came along late in the day. So by the time he arrived, the, the, the um, home was ruled by the women. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank Auntie Shirley for her kind introduction to country um, and her generous introduction to country. And it's lovely, obviously, on an occasion like this to have um, one of the aunties do that rather than one of the uncles. And I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners um, and say thank you for their hospitality on this land. I think we're, we're all very proud of the enduring culture and the ancient culture that we can in some way say that we're part of and hopefully we can continue with some respect. Um, I think the theme of today's conference is really exciting. Um, when Father Patrick called me, he said, we want to do a session on um, women in sacred texts and traditions that resonate and inspire for our times. Um, and I'm really excited having, having talked to the contributors and read through um, the women that they're going to talk to you about today, all of whom were, were or are inspirational leaders. Um, Today's theme was, as I understand it, inspired by the Black Lives Movement and inspired particularly by the Me Too movement, um, which really has, has questioned um, patriarchal attitudes and started to kind of demand new respect or new 21st century respect, perhaps we should say, for women. Um, and has shone a light on the objectification and the, and the abuse of women whether that's sexual abuse and domestic abuse, or whether it's simply been the denial of their full participation in society at whatever levels that may mean. Um, so it's great to be involved in something like this that, that truly is about women's agency and what that can do for all society. Um, I 
have felt that this this theme is particularly relevant now in October after the last two months when we've all watched, I suspect, quite keenly what's been happening in Afghanistan. Um, and we we think we know anyway all too well the impact that that will have on Afghan women and girls, their rights and their freedoms. And actually the responsibilities that have come with those rights and freedoms and responsibilities they have been able to exercise and they're already grieving for the loss of. Um, the seeming removal of, of those rights and responsibilities too leaves them very vulnerable. Many have fled for their lives as we know. Um, some, as you may have read in things like Marie Claire magazine, for example, have chosen to stay on and fight. Um, that's a very brave thing to do. I don't know if I could do the same in their position, but they don't want their light to be dimmed and they want to play a part in educating Afghan girls for the future. So in, in that context, I'm really excited today to be able to introduce three women to you who are all educators and leaders. Um, in Australia, but also in their own faith traditions. Um, I'm keeping a close eye on the time. So I think what we'll do is we'll introduce each speaker um, individually, um, rather than give you a quick overview of, of all of them at this point. So we're going to, we, we have three speakers, one from the Jewish tradition, one from the Catholic tradition, and one from the Sunni Muslim tradition. Um, I think we'll kick off with Jackie, um, Jackie Seaman Sharak is an employment discrimination and education lawyer. Um, she wrote the chapter on religion and schools in the Palgrave Handbook of Education Law for Schools. She's a co-founder of Or Chadash, a modern Orthodox synagogue, and also of the Sydney Women's Te Tefila Group. You'll have to correct me if I've pronounced that wrong, Jackie. Um, Jackie's also a soccer player, and we've probably seen the emergence of many women's soccer teams, indeed, including from Afghanistan. Um, she's a member of the Football New South Wales General Purposes Tribunal, and she too is a proud wife and a mother of five involved Jews. Jackie, can I hand over to you? Thanks very much, Jane. I'd also like to acknowledge that I am living and speaking to you from the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and pause for just a minute to think about the importance of absorbing what we can from the stories of those who've had the custodianship of this land before us, because there's so much that we can learn from each other's stories and absorb into our own lives. And now I want to move into some Jewish stories. My grandmothers were born in the early 1900s into a world where Jewish girls were expected to be literate but not learned. They were excluded from religious leadership and most of the religious ritual of the synagogue. They were unable to be called rabbi or teacher or to make Jewish legal rulings. They were also excluded from communal leadership, except in women's organisations. As feminism rippled through the 20th century, it affected Judaism too. Over the last 100 years, and particularly in my lifetime, we've seen enormous change. I'll come back, back to that change later. For now, I want to explore the stories of two women in Jewish texts, stories that have been with us for millennia, but that became more prominent when Jewish women began to rediscover their history and look for inspiration as they challenged the status quo. Those two women are Devorah and Bruria. Devorah was both a prophet and a judge. In fact, commentators say she was able to become a judge precisely because she had the power of prophecy. That is, she could see and articulate what God wanted. She appears towards the beginning of the book of Judges in the second, that is the middle section of Tanakh, which is the Hebrew name for the Jewish Bible. That second section is called the prophets. Torah, the first section, provides the core narrative of Jewish identity and mission from creation all the way to freedom from slavery in Egypt and entering the land of Israel. That narrative incorporates the revelation of the law on Mount Sinai. So central is Torah that we use that term to refer to all Jewish law and learning. The stories of the prophets that come after Torah then trace the political development of the people of Israel into a nation. And Devorah's story in that context is placed at around the year 1200 before the Christian era. At this point, the people of Israel are living in independent but connected tribes, each in their own part of the country. From time to time, 
they abandon the ways of the Torah and serve idols. The text tells, that, tells us that as punishment for this, God permits neighbouring nations to take advantage of their disunity and to oppress them. But then the Israelites realise they've done the wrong thing and they repent. And each time God sends a judge to protect and rule them. And while that judge rules, all is well until next time. Devorah's story is one of these cycles. The Israelites had sinned again and God had allowed them to be conquered by Yavin, king of Canaan in the north of Israel. The captain of his army was Sisera and for 20 years he oppressed the people of Israel. And now I turn to the text in the prophets. And Devorah, a prophetess, a woman of Lapidot, judged Israel at that time. Now the phrase in Hebrew is Ishat Neviah, a woman prophet, Eshet Lapidot. This could be read as a wife of a man called Lapidot. But the grammar actually indicates otherwise. Lapidot means flame or torch. And medieval scholars suggest that Devorah was a woman of valour, diligent in her ways, as quick as a fire torch, a fiery, strong personality. The text goes on, and she lived under the palm tree of Devorah between Ramah and Bethel in Mount Ephraim, and the people of Israel came up to her for judgment. What's the significance of a palm tree, we might ask? One reading is that sitting out in the open meant she was always available to the people. She could be seen. She was accessible. Her leadership style was transparent. Alternatively, the palm tree symbolises national unity because a palm tree has one heart in its core. So Israel in that generation had only one heart devoted to God. So, so far, Devorah is a judge. She ensures that the people are living lives of justice and she's uniting them. But it turns out that she's a multifaceted leader. The text goes on. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, and said to him, hasn't the Lord God of Israel commanded you, saying, go and gather your men to Mount Tavor and take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun? So she's directing him to bring the tribes together. And I will draw to you Sisera, the captain of Yavin's army, with his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into your hand. And she's setting out what God says is the military strategy. And Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with you. But the journey that you take will not be for your honour. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Devorah got up and went with Barak. So what's the outcome of this venture? The story goes on. Following Devorah's directions, Barak and his 10,000 men defeat Sisera's army. And Sisera is killed by another woman. Yeah, El, that's another story. And Devorah sings a song of praise to God and to all the people whose efforts contributed to the release of Israel from oppression. Not many people in Tanakh get to sing their own song, interestingly. The others are Moses, Miriam, Hannah and David. Through divine inspiration, each song captures a moment of great historical importance and insight. So in Devorah's song, as she begins, she describes the Canaanite oppression and she sings the main roads ceased and travellers walked through crooked back, back roads. The inhabitants of the villages ceased until I, Devorah, arose, a mother in Israel. That phrase, a mother in Israel, it's interpreted by medieval scholars to mean a mother and a leader. She's admonishing her children to repair their ways. She has compassion for them and she brings about the rebirth of the nation because Devorah's campaign impacts not only on the northern tribes that the Canaanites were directly persecuting, she sees the bigger geopolitical picture and she works to remove the threat to the nation as a whole. She has fabulous people skills, to use our language. She inspires and she motivates Barak to do what is necessary and she also directs the military strategy. Her story finishes with, and the land was at rest for 40 years. That's a very significant statement. 40 is a number used throughout Tanakh to refer to what's basically a long period of time. In other words, Devorah's leadership resulted in a sustained period of stability. She's one of the most successful of all the judges. Fast forwarding through history, I wanna to come to our second story, which is about the Talmudic sage, Bururia. According to the Talmud, Bururia lived in Israel in the second century of the Christian era. Israel was then under the rule of the Roman empire, which had destroyed Jerusalem and its temple and exiled and enslaved many Jews. Jewish life had shifted from temple worship to a focus on scholarship, serving God by seeking to understand the law and God's purpose for humanity. Tradition tells us that when Moses received the law on Mount Sinai, 
as well as the written law contained in the Torah itself, God also gave him oral instructions for, for applying the laws to real life across the ages. That tradition was passed down orally through rabbinical academies for centuries. And then it was finally written down in stages from the second to the eighth centuries to preserve that tradition. And that reduction we call the Talmud. Talmud became the primary source of Jewish religious law and Jewish theology. And as a result, it's the guide for daily life and it has become the shaper of Jewish culture over centuries with its emphasis on learning, on analysis, on intellectual challenge. And Jewish scholars continue to study Talmud today and to write new commentaries, keeping it relevant and alive to help guide contemporary Judaism. So to the story of Bruria. Her father, Hananya ben Teradion, and her husband, Meir, were both prominent rabbis of the Talmudic era. And Bruria herself is one of the few women named in Talmud and one of even fewer whose words and teachings are treated as authoritative. But she really is an authority. She's the only woman who gets to discuss legal issues as a peer and a colleague of the male scholars of the Talmud. One story tells of her extraordinary intellectual ability by saying that she would learn 300 rulings a day from 300 masters. There are a number of stories about her in the Talmud and I've chosen two. So now I'm quoting from the Talmud. There were once some hooligans in the neighborhood of Rabbi Meir who caused him a great deal of trouble. Rabbi Meir prayed to God that they should die. His wife, Bruria, said to him, why do you think that you're allowed to pray for them to die? Is it because it's written, let sins desist from the earth? She's quoting from Psalms here. Does it say sinners? No, it says sins. Also, look at the end of the verse. It goes on, and let evil do as be no more. Once there are no more sins, there will no longer be wicked people. Instead of praying for them to die, you should pray that they repent, and then there will be no more wicked people. He did pray for them, and they repented. Interestingly, Rabbi Meir appears here not as Bruria's intellectual equal, but as her student. He is caught up in the literal meaning of the words, and she is able to offer an, a creative and an alternative reading. She tells him to separate actions from people's essences. She tells him to hate the sin and not the sin. Bruria is criticizing from the inside, using her textual knowledge, but she's bringing a heightened sensitivity or ethical intuition. She is concerned with what we might call the embodiment of Torah values. Rabbi Meir has lost touch with a central Jewish value, shuva, repentance, the ability to change, and Bruria refocuses him. A second story. Rabbi Yossi the Galilean was walking down a road when he met Bruria. He asked her, which is the road we take to Lod? She said, foolish Galilean, didn't the sages say, don't indulge in excessive conversation with a woman? You should have said, which to Lod? On the face of it, Bria is simply quoting and accepting an injunction in Pekar Vot, the Ethics of the Fathers, which is an early book of the Talmud, not to speak at length with women, which perhaps might have been justified at the time by keeping men and women from impropriety. Both traditional and modern scholarship have a lot to say about this text, and some of them draw from what Bria is about to do with the text. She says, why are you using four words to ask me for directions when you could have used just two? But is she merely accepting the text at face value? There's a lot more going on here. The language suggests that Rabbi Yossi is asking Bria to travel with him. There's something morally amiss here. Is he just asking for directions or is he propositioning her? Bria may be angry that he's objecting any woman. And more than that, she's not just a woman, she's a scholar and a sage. Maybe she's angry at him for speaking to her about mundane matters rather than Torah. Maybe she's saying, if I'm just a woman, don't speak too much. If you treated me like a sage as I deserve, that'd be a different story. We could engage in learning together. She challenges the text. She makes it clear that it has the effect of sharply limiting women's voices, cutting them off from the conversations of the greatest cultural import of her time, those within the halls of the Talmudic academies. And the Talmud records that criticism for posterity, implicitly approving it. There are many modern scholars who accept Baru's criticism and find ways of inverting the text to mean that a man should not indulge in frivolous conversation with women, but rather engage them in meaningful discussion and welcome them to halls of learning. So what lessons do we take from these two amazing characters? Clearly they have wisdom and insight. One is a political leader and one a spiritual leader. In Devorah's case, 
Her leadership and courage literally save the people from oppression and unite them. In Breuer's, she contributes to our understanding of the law and ethics. Importantly, while they're very unusual for their times, both are accepted within their own texts as legitimate. The Book of Judges does not question Devorah's right to be a judge. The Talmud quotes Breuer for her wisdom on a number of occasions. Both work inside the system of their times and understand it. Devorah warns Barak that he will be criticised or mocked for seeding militarily only with the help of a woman. And Breuer quotes tradition in order to critique tradition. For us in, 20, in the 20th and 21st centuries, both these women have served as justification for change and expanding women's roles in Judaism, giving us more opportunity and ultimately more self-determination, a role in the shaping of the Jewish future. Devorah has been used to justify women taking positions of authority in the Jewish world. Women as synagogue presidents, a female president of the State of Israel, sorry, Prime Minister of the State of Israel, and also for women having authority to make religious rulings. Breuer has been one of the role models quoted in opening up serious Jewish study to women over the last century, which, given the importance of knowledge and scholarship to religious authority, is crucially important. And most recently, women have started to be ordained as clergy within the orthodox strands of Judaism. My grandmothers would be astonished at some of the change within Judaism and the freedom and opportunity it has given their five great granddaughters. And there is more to come. In no small part, like the changes so far, future change will be supported by the stories of these two women, Devorah and Borea, and others in our text in history. Thank you, Jackie. That was really thought provoking um, and so, so timely, I think for our age, so timely for our age. Um, it was wonderful, wonderful to hear about Devorah as a judge and a prophet. Um, Particularly, I think, I mean, I've, I've been very conscious over the last week or so that um, female judges in Afghanistan have apparently gone into hiding um, because they're not, A, they're not allowed to work anymore, and B, um, the Taliban has released um, men from the prisons, presumably women too, um, and um, the, the female judges are very scared that they will be hunted down for retribution. So it's wonderful to, to hear of, of female judges. Um, I, I wonder what contemporary lesson that you feel for you feel Devorah offers us within an Australian context or within any other international context, Afghanistan, Israel, or anywhere else. Thanks, Jane. I, I think she's a she's just a fabulous role model with the clarity of her thinking, uh, the the ability to see the big picture, and the ability to articulate it. And not be and and that she points out to Barack that he shouldn't be afraid of public opinion. Okay, we'll do it this way. Public opinion won't necessarily like it, but we'll get the result. And she's just she's just there. She puts herself out there. She puts herself in the public view. She makes herself accessible. And as I said, she's she's just so clear in understanding what needs to be done. Not all of us have the gift of prophecy, so that's not necessarily available to us all. But looking for inspiration and looking to see the bigger picture and looking to understand what makes sense to achieve what needs to happen. As a kind of general question, um, relig religions provide inspiration and guidance on equality and participation, but the patriarchal culture that still resides or is still kind of dominates or swamps many, um, how can we subvert that culture in good ways in 2020, 2021, 2022, and going forward? I think that when you look closely, I, I, I can really only speak for Judaism, but I think it's true of other religions as well, that, that religion itself gives us those tools. Like I said, Devorah may be an outlier, but the Book of Judges just accepts her and allows us to use her as a role model. Buria may be unique, but the Talmud quotes her as an authority and gives her a voice. And we can, we can use, we can find those, those references in the text that give us confidence and authority to move onwards. Because even in those patriarchal structures that existed in what you might call ancient times and up to medieval and, and early modern times, there were role models of women doing the things that we now want women to do as a matter of course. Uh, there's, there's many more. I mean, I've only chosen, I've chosen two. There are many more 
outstanding, unusual women across the ages. And I also think that, that there are many ways we can go back to original texts and use those to subvert. So I once um, heard a, um, uh, a rabbi in the Sydney community teach that um, when you look at the fall of, of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the creation of inequality between man and woman, uh, when we're given the job to go out into the world and fix it and restore it, part of the job we're given, he taught, was to reverse that inequality and bring back the perfection of the equality of gender, of, of, of the equality of people regardless of gender that existed in the Garden of Eden. So when you look closely enough and when you have the religious learning, and that's what's critical to these stories because they're both women who, ha who have power because they have religious knowledge and religious learning, you can use that appropriately to progress. As, as you say, they were both outliers to a large extent, or they were both outliers. Can I ask you, while, while we're listening to the other women speak today, to, to think about um, prophetic Jewish leaders in the contemporary period too, who sure. may, who may um, take, take those cracks forward. Religion opens up cracks and we need to push them open wider. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. I mean, there's, a, there's an enormous amount that's happened, as I said, in the last century, and there's some fabulous people that have been instrumental in that, including some inspirational women, and I can touch on their stories. And, fantastic. And, and it might also be worth thinking about whether or not um, men have a role in supporting women's agency and supporting the women sure. that role have, both in our wider social and political life, but in our religious life too. Sure. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could, could I just say to, to everybody who's joined us, and I think there are about 350 people, which is, I oh know, about 200 people, but we're expecting more, which is wonderful. Um, as our speakers are speaking, or, or as I'm speaking, please feel free to add your conversations, in, add your questions into the chat or points that you might like to raise. Um, and we'll try to involve everybody. Um, I'll, tr I'll try to reflect those questions as we go along, but there'll also be a sort of open Q&A towards the end. Thank you. So our next speaker is actually um, Michelle Connolly. Um, Michelle is um, a, a Catholic and a nun. Um, I think I'm right in saying that um, Michelle um, as a um, RSJ. Um, she's a fantastic educator. Um, she lectures in Biblical Studies at the Catholic Institute of Sydney, but her history of teaching is just phenomenal. Um, she did her undergraduate degree at ANU, then did a dip ed at the University of New England in Armadale. Um, she taught as a sister of St. Joseph in secondary schools in the Diocese of um, Maitland and Newcastle. Um, then she moved into theological education. Um, she spent many years studying. Um, interspersed with teaching biblical studies at Catholic Theological Union in Hunters Hill, Sydney um, in the 90s and then at the Catholic Institute of Sydney in 2001. Um, she has been the deputy president of the Catholic Institute of Sydney. She was the academic dean of the Catholic Institute um, and she served as the secretary of the Australian Catholic Biblical Association from 2008 to 2011. Um, she, since returning to Sydney in early 2000s, she's actually participated and contributed to many forms of, ad, of adult education, and I think has probably pushed those boundaries forward. Um, and that's been in dioceses, parishes, religious orders, and in various renewal groups. Um, so that picks up really on what we were talking about with Jackie a moment ago about how how the 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 women, the strong women in our different religious traditions can help us carry forward to renew and refresh our faith in the 21st century. Now, Michelle has actually chosen um, women from the 21st century, women from um, our own times. So, Michelle, may I hand over to you? Thank you very much for being part of this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Um, before I begin, I, like the others, would like to acknowledge the, um, the Indigenous foremothers and forefathers of this land uh, who have uh, exercised custodianship of this land and have uh, acquired and carried forward and offer to us a great wisdom uh, about how to live in this world and about, about spiritual life. 
I'm going to share my screen. Uh, this may take a moment or two and we hope it goes well. So uh, I'm going to share now. And trust that you can see uh, a screen, uh, a title screen. So as Jane said, I'm going to talk today about women in the Catholic denomination of the Christian tradition, women who inspire me. I'm talking about Catholic women because that is part of the Christian tradition in which I live. I am choosing not to talk about women in Catholic history of 2000 years or even from the New Testament because that history is so large that I found it too difficult to choose. I salute Jackie that she uh, managed to be so disciplined. Uh, instead, I choose to speak about two individual women and one group of women uh, who are known to me in Australia today, who inspire me as they live their Catholic faith now. All of these inspiring women are lay women who negotiate their lives and their faith as individuals, some married, some not. One of the things I find inspiring about these women is that they are living their faith in a vigorous way, but not within existing formal structures within the Roman Catholic Church, such as religious life as Sisters of St. Joseph, like myself, or Sisters of Mercy, or of Charity, or of St. Francis, or of St. Dominic, or I think you know what I mean. Instead, all of these women live their Catholic faith in ways that they are inventing as they do it in the real world right here and now. This costs these women. In very real ways, as Catholic women today, they put their money where their faith is. They do this because their faith matters to them. Because today in the Catholic Church, this is what they believe they have to do to keep spirituality alive and thriving for themselves and for others. All of these women have had to find ways to live their faith-filled lives without a lot of support from the official structures of the church. Like so many pioneers, they are ahead of the official structures, perhaps puzzling or even disconcerting some of the people, mostly male persons, who are officially responsible for these structures. As I watch these women, they sound to me very like the women who founded Catholic apostolic religious orders two to 300 years ago in the social distress caused by the industrial revolution in Northwest Europe, but also in the new world in places like raw colonial Australia. In those situations, there was a crying need for education, for healthcare and for social work, which the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Sisters of Mercy and of Charity and of various saints provided. But there is another need today, which these women are all addressing. I think it is the need for religious meaning in life, expressed and lived with a Catholic sacramental sensibility here and now. These women are all serious women, although they all have a great sense of the ridiculous. And they are seeking what I will sum up in the word spirituality. That is, some deep sense of the connection of life to the ultimate, to the divine. When I say spirituality, I am not talking pastel-coloured, fluffy feelings. These women are beyond fluffy. I am talking about a conscious, alert engagement of the person with life in all its shades of grey, lived with faith in the crucified and raised Christ, who sustains us by his spirit and by his body and blood as food. These women want these things to connect in their lives. They want them to be support as they engage with the pressing social issues of today. Because they pursue this goal seriously and effectively, these women inspire me. So enough of generalities. I'm going to discuss in turn, first two individuals and one group of women, women I want to say here that I explained this talk to all of these women and have their explicit written permission to talk about them and to use the images of themselves that they sent to me. So 
First to be discussed is a laywoman named Andrea Dean. Andrea began her early adult life in religious life with the Sisters of St. Joseph Goulburn. And with those sisters, she taught in schools in the rural diocese of Goulburn and for three years on mission in Papua New Guinea. Andrea eventually moved into leadership, facilitation and lecturing in Catholic education at high levels in the Canberra Goulburn area. On leaving religious life, Andrea began her own business, Future Matters, focusing on spiritual growth programs and life coaching. Andrea won for her work and to assist her work, won a Churchill Fellowship in 2004. Andrea works with education leaders and she has coordinated a national leadership program for young women. Andrea also worked full-time for three years for the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference as Director for, of the Office for the Promotion of Women and Director of Lay Pastoral Ministry. In her role as Director of the Office for the Participation of Women, she organised a national conference to reflect on 20 years of implementation of an Australian Catholic Church document on gender in the church, which was called Woman and Man, One in Christ Jesus. From the papers of that conference, Andrea launched a book called Still Listening to the Spirit, Woman and Man 20 Years On, which named the various ways that the church had attempted and in some ways perhaps not succeeded to implement recommendations made in 2000 to foster greater opportunities for women in the Australian Catholic Church in leadership, decision-making and ministry. These positions in which Andrea worked closed when, under some financial pressure in 2019, the Australian Catholic Bishops' Conference shut down a number of councils and offices. Andrea has worked as a spiritual director and trained in that, she has worked for women within the church in situations that offer little guarantee of permanence and are always subject to closure. She has had to craft a way to earn her living while keeping al alive her commitment to her faith. She is entrepreneurial in matters of faith and religion. She has learned spirituality and wisdom by doing it without the security buffer of formal, ecclesially assured protection around her. She has become uniquely qualified to guide women in their growth in, the, in their faith in the church. Andrea Dean puts her money where her faith is. She inspires me. The second woman who inspires me is another individual, Dr. Christina Gomez. I am proud to say that I taught Christina. She was a young married woman studying postgraduate theology intelligently and with the passion with which she lives. Christina today has two children still in school. Her school teacher husband, Adrian, is a deacon in the Catholic Church, a part-time but demanding role for which she gives him support and encouragement. As she prepared to be a mother for the first time, while at the same time pursuing postgraduate studies, Christina lamented to me that she could find no religious material that told her how to be a Catholic mother and an educated questioning theologian at the same time. This led to an academic quest for the reasons behind this situation. It culminated in a doctoral dissertation, which Christina then published as her first book, entitled The Church as Woman and Mother, Historical and Theological Foundations. In her PhD thesis, Christina showed step by step how the church came to be defined as woman and mother and what that means for actual women and mothers. She showed how it happened that non-women and non-mothers that is male persons who are called fathers of the church, got to define what a woman and a mother is. And 
how limited that vision has proved to be in some cases and with some notable exceptions that she notes. In order to make life as a feminist theologian, Christina has had not only to work hard, but to be very agile and creative, like Andrea, entrepreneurial. Her academic CV, pages long, lists the many grants and scholarships she has won, the overseas study she has managed to do, the extensive publications she has already produced, the growing direction of her academic and intellectual progress. Most recently, as she claims her Filipina heritage, she's creating a babbai, which is woman in Tagalog, a babbai theology and a mothers and daughters course to accompany the project. Christina has done all this as a wife and mother. She has had to seek work as a female feminist academic theologian where she could find it, eventually most reliably in secular university settings. Long-term church employment is hard to come by. Christina could have had a secure career teaching high school maths with a nice retirement and superannuation. Instead, she has chosen to pursue her faith intelligently, not hiding her light under a bushel, in many ways paying the price in terms of secure employment. In her own words, she accounts for what she is doing like this. She says, I can't think of anything except that I probably am meant to do this work just because I've encountered so many hurdles and yet I'm still in it. And every time it feels just all too hard, the burden of patriarchy, of sexism, of racism, colonialism, I get grant funding or I win an award or someone gives me an opportunity which leads to another opportunity and support such as from hubby and from lecturers like yourself go without saying. Dr. Christina Gomez, faithful Catholic woman, inspires me. Finally, I want to talk about a group of women who include both formal members of religious congregations, but are mostly lay women. They call themselves spirit weavers. They hail from the Australian country diocese of Wagga, home to many famous Australian sports champions and to champion Catholic women. The spirit weavers of the Catholic diocese of Wagga grew out of their diocesan chapter of an official Catholic church group called the Council for Australian Catholic Women, CACW, which was set up to help implement the document Woman and Man, One in Christ Jesus. There it is again. They want to stress that they were supported by their bishop when they began, Bishop Jared Hanna, and they have a good relationship with their current bishop, Bishop Mark Edwards. Support from these bishops includes some funding for the spirituality days for women that they run. They also want to acknowledge the support in many forms of religious sisters in their diocese, particularly Sister Margaret Walsh, Presentation Sister, who is their official patron, and Sister Liz Roth, a Sister of Mercy. However, not everyone likes what they do and they have to contend with that. Perhaps their most important achievement is that they have discovered and they seek to promote the talents of women in the Catholic Church. The woman who communicated with me about this talk, Catherine Clapdor, said of attending a CACW colloquium in Sydney in 2013, it was inspirational and empowering for me. So many gifted women. I'm also now on the team of Margaret's Breath of Life Ministry. A religious tradition that tends to foreground male persons, educated in a very specific way, in a solely male hierarchalized structure, tends to obliterate the talents of women in anything other than nurturing roles focused on husband and children. These women at Wagga recognized that there are talented women, including amongst themselves, and they seek to promote that. So when four of them returned from that 
2013 colloquium, they say they knew they had to do something. So they got organised. They got church support and approval. In a very large rural diocese, and with the assistance no less of Andrea Dean, they rethought the structure and the principles of how Catholic women could gather. They set up programs that they heard about at the 2013 colloquium. When CACW came suddenly to an end in 2019, these women chose through ups and downs to continue to find ways to sustain themselves spiritually in their local Catholic environment. They decided they needed a new name, but they wanted one that harked back to CACW. So they are spirit weavers, contemplative, active Christian women. 200 years ago, women in formal religious orders like the one to which I belong, built big brick schools, hospitals and convents. We've all seen them all around this country. These 21st century Catholic rural lay women pressed their children to help them build a website full of resources for spiritual life and growth. They have used their passion and their readiness to work together to provide something that nourishes their faith in a way that works for them within the Catholic Church. They inspire me because they have not let themselves languish. They are energetic, responding to the spirit, yet another group of entrepreneurial women who are putting their money, their time and their energies, sometimes against opposition, to nourish their own faith and spirituality. Spirit weavers of Wagga, you contemplative, active Christian women, you inspire me. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, I've actually come out in goose pimples. Um, I feel inspired too, very much inspired. And hearing those stories of female empowerment actually empowers others, doesn't it? Um, I think so. And what wonderful role models that you've just cited from 21st century Australia. Um, one of the things I find so fascinating is that we talk a lot about things like patriarchy and sexism and racism and colonialism and sometimes I think within the, this kind of higher level debate and you know academic almost labels that we forget that those those issues those things are about real people um, and I think what you've just been been sharing with us is is real women um, overcoming those things um, and I'd, I'd love to hear further your thoughts about how, how women can survive without the official support of the Catholic Church, um, without job security, without the risk of their roles, well, with the risk of their roles being shut down due to financial constraints, because the lack of funding, is it, it, the lack of funding within the church would indicate that it's not a priority. So how do, the, how do, how should women navigate those waters and create a movement for change whereby it becomes a priority? Uh, well, you know, the $64 million question, Jane, first off, uh, look, uh, I think women uh, have to keep doing the sort of things that Andrea Dean and uh, Christina Gomez and the Spirit Weavers of Wagga are doing. And, and there are many other women like that who are, who are trying to keep their faith alive uh, in a way that works for them and for their families, for their for their children, about whom they are concerned, uh, they have to find they have to be entrepreneurial. Um, I think they have to keep talking. That is one way. I think what the spirit weavers have shown is that they 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 are not out to kill the institutional church. They have uh, they have pursued good relations with with the church because they are part of it and they they love it and they do not want to leave it. So. Uh, they have pursued that kind of thing, uh, but they, um, you know, they have to be uh, uh, productive. Sometimes they have to make a life in one way and spend, uh, spend, you know, their leisure in a way 
uh, promoting their faith. They have to find people who will support them. For example, again, I mean, I, I, could, I know for sure that um, Christina has been supported by uh, a number of Catholic religious orders actively support um, uh, young Catholic women in various ways. They have funded all sorts of um, conferences or uh, education opportunities for young women, bursaries. Uh, and, you know, I know that, that uh, these people I've spoken about have enjoyed those sorts of things. I, I think they have to uh, find the support they can, and I think they have to keep themselves um, in consciousness. I would say uh, that um, people might be aware that within the Catholic Church, uh, in this country, there has been over a period of years building towards something which came to um, a, a, a major point uh, in this past week called the uh, Plenary Council, which is the first that has happened for I forget how many years, um, you know, like decades and decades and decades in the church. Uh, and one of the things that has happened as a result of the of the work that women have done for for decades, raising consciousness refusing to go away is that um, that conference very intentionally foregrounded women, made sure that women were there, made sure that women had a voice, were involved in the processes. Now, there's still work to go in that, uh, but, but I think that's one measure of what has happened. Do you think, and perhaps this is something that could be could be brought up at the plenary and could be carried forward by the plenary, do you think um, there would be value for the church in having at least one day a year which honours the role of, of women in the church? You know, I don't know what it might be called. Um, Mary Colo has actually suggested this. Um, you know, could we have one Sunday a year named as Women in the Church Day? Uh, what a great one idea. Or one uh, a month. Yes, uh, you know, apart from Mother's Day, yes. not that I'm against mothers, and I, that's why I mentioned Christina Gomez, yeah, uh, you know, um, uh, for who, who has used that experience, uh, you know, to, to develop her own academic theological work uh, and, and has done it very creatively. Uh, but, you know, women can do more than that. I think um, uh, I was very glad to listen to um, our Jewish speaker, you know, pointing out other things that women are able to do. It's a little bit like actually creating the imagination um, of people uh, in, in people for what women actually are able to do. But do, you, do, you, do you think that there could be now and into the future a kind of women in the church movement that, that might, might be only in the Catholic church or might expand to include other faiths? that could, could profile the roles of women, that could draw together the, the sources of funding, the Churchill scholarships, the, mm. you know, the, where you may apply, apply for grants, what sort of opportunities that might be, what kind of roles you might take up? Uh, yes, I think that's possible. Uh, in many ways, I think that would have been within the brief of what um, Andrea Dean did when, when she was director of the Office for the Participation of Women. That's really what, what that was about. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that circumstances meant that that office and many others at the time um, had to uh, no longer received funding. And of course, it's very difficult for that sort of work to be done by somebody who doesn't, um, who isn't supported financially with a salary to do it. Uh, mm. So yes, I think there's a need for it. Now, how that gets organised, that's, that is another question. Um, there, there possibly are, you know, disparate groups all over the place, in a way, trying to do that. Perhaps, perhaps, you know, there needs to be some sort of gathering together of those forces and that knowledge uh, uh, to, to make that more possible. And, and some fun. Oh, I hope everybody's happy with the recording being in progress. And I guess, I mean, ultimately, that, as you say, requires some form of funding, doesn't it? And some commitment from a largely male dominated hierarchy, um, unless a female benefactor or a male benefactor can be found to support that kind of initiative. When I was thinking, you know, it, it could even be possible for a dedicated page within, you know, the Catholic media or within the Jewish media, um, but a page for women that's not about, as you say, mothering, yes. not, not, about, Only. Uh, not about domestic issues, but about the role for women in church and the role for women in the society in society more broadly. Yes, yes, I, I do think there's a social imaginary here um, uh, for both men and women to de to develop, you know, to ac 
to really come to terms. Uh, I mean, women are doing so much. I think it doesn't hasn't entered perhaps yet successfully the social imaginary uh, of this is a normal thing for women to do, to, to be doing the sort of things we're seeing on the national scene. You know, we've seen a female prime minister. We've seen, you know, a number of female premiers. We're seeing women in politics, um, uh, uh, but but focusing it uh, in in the social imagination, I think, is it's still a work in progress. Absolutely, and and there've been a few great documentaries recently about women in politics yes. um, and in leadership roles. But yes. we need more of them, don't yes, we? Yes, indeed. Um, I, I would love now to introduce our third speaker. And before I do that, can I please invite and encourage you all to um, put forward questions? I've got a few coming up on the screen in front of me, um, which uh, after our next speaker, I'll, I'll throw open to a kind of a three-way conversation. Um, but I'd love to be able to put your questions into the mix too. Um, so our, our next speaker is a Sunni Muslim, Yamama Aga. Um, and I'm thrilled to say she's going to be speaking about Khadija, who, as probably everybody knows, was the wife of the Prophet Muhammad. And, and really, um, in some ways, and I hope that I'm not saying anything that um, is sacrilegious in any way, but in, in many ways, as an older woman, she had achieved far more ahead of him, I should say. Um, Yamama has a, a fascinating background. She's the general manager for service delivery at Settlement Services International, um, where she joined. She joined there in 2011, um, where she was the manager of the humanitarian settlement program. Um, she has extensive experience in team leadership, project management, program management and stakeholder engagement. She leads all of SSI's settlement programs, um, supporting newcomers and other vulnerable Australians to prosper. So I'm, I'm sure she probably has a lot of hands-on experience at the moment with the Afghan community coming in and our, our new Afghan Australians who we're delighted to, to be able to welcome. Um, with over 15 years of experience assisting new arrivals to settle into Australia, Yamama has a strong passion for delivering social justice to refugees and vulnerable groups in need. She has a special interest in women's rights and supporting and empowering refugee women and their families to reach their potential. So I'm thrilled that you're here today, Yamama, and very happy to hand over to you to hear more about Khadija. Thank you very much, Jane. Good afternoon, everyone. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm joining you from, the Darug people. We pay our respects to their elders past and present. I would also like to acknowledge uh, my, my fellow speakers, Michelle and Jackie, and their day inspiring presentation. Thank you. As a woman of the Islamic faith, today I'll be casting a light on the positive role of women from the Islam tradition. A woman from my tradition who greatly inspires me both personally and in my professional line of work is Khadija bint Khuwailid, who I would describe as the first woman of Islam. She was the first wife of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and so much more. Before delving into the historical context, I have two questions I'd like you to keep in mind as I speak about Khadija's legacy. One is, women of Islam are incredibly resourceful and influential. How do we take that legacy and execute the, that tradition in the 21st century? And as women, who are, who are we in terms of Khadija? Now, to introduce you to the strong-willed, independent, and entrepreneurial spirit that is Khadija, Khadija was born into a merchant family of the Quraysh tribe, in a life of privilege in Mecca. Something important to note is that Khadija was born before the time of the Islam faith. As the sole daughter of a prosperous merchant, businessman, and leader of the Quraysh tribe, Khadija took over the business after her father's passing. Her first marriage left her a widow. After her second marriage, she turned down numerous proposals from wealthy men expressing little desire to remarry a third time. Instead, she focused on raising her children and developing the merchant business inherited from her father. During a time when society was ruthless and male dominated. As a successful businesswoman, she controlled one of the most important caravan trade routes in the region, 
Her caravans became famous and could be found all over the Arabian Peninsula, from Yemen to northern Syria. Although often consulting her brothers and uncles, it was always Khadija who had the final word and led the family business. Khadija not only challenged the status quo of her time as a woman by building and leading one of the most affluent business powerhouses in the region, and consequently yielding great economic and political power and influence, she also challenged social norms of the day. Before Islam, Khadija was already a remarkable woman who stood out with her strength of character, power, and autonomy. And her decision to choose her third husband, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, who was almost half her age, illustrates her zealous, courageous, and unconventional nature. In an era dominated by men and polygamy, where, where women had no rights or social status, Khadija proposed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was equally remarkable in nature, not social status, to Khadija. It was precisely his strength of character that made Khadija notice him. Before proposing to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Khadija employed him to expand her business empire, sending him to, on expeditions with which he carried out to great success. From word of mouth, Khadija learned about his humanity and good-spirited nature. She was further, further intrigued. And when he carried out her business operations, she was convinced that she wanted to pair together with this well-intentioned man. Marriages at this time were typically necessary for survival and not always about romantic notions of love as they are in today's world. But Khadija didn't need a husband out of necessity to take care of her financially. And the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not have the financial means to seek a wife. Khadija and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, not only became distinct in the eyes of the public, but also in the eyes of God. This is a part of the story where the Islam faith is birthed. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had a divine revelation similar to other Abrahamic religions where a prophet experiences an angel or divine visitation, propelling the chosen individual to spread the word about a new divine order. When Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, told Khadija about his divine revelation, she encouraged him to leave the business and preach full time. She was the first person to convert to Islam and wholeheartedly supported her husband's prophet, prophetic mission. Khadija supported Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, financially to pour all his energy into preaching, sustaining him for the rest of her life. Where necessary, she supported his followers too. In the early years, when the growth of Islam was slow and increasingly dangerous, Khadija protected Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, with her political power and influence. As individuals and people, we are not one-dimensional, holding only one aspect to our identities. It was the same for Khadija. Like all of us, Khadija has multiple layers to her identity. I refer to these as the four pillars, the serial entrepreneur, the social disruptor and feminist, and the first woman of Islam, and the humanitarian. I mentioned how Khadija became the region's most influential influential entrepreneur and businesswoman, how she challenged the status quo of and social norms of the day by proposing to a man who is younger than her, her spiritual life, and how she became the first woman of Islam. Finally, I'd like to cover the fourth pillar of Khadija, her humanitarian mm -hmm. focus. Khadija, before Islam, used her property in the form of gold, food, and money to help people in need. Compassionate and hardworking, Khadija gave a great deal of money to help others, assisting the poor, sick, disabled, widows, orphans, and giving poor couples money to marry. In Islam, whether rich or poor, one's financial condition is a test. Khadija gave her earnings to the poor and the orphans, to the widows and to the sick. She helped poor girls get married and provided their dowry. Once Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, began his spiritual quest to build a following in the Islam faith, 
Khadija invested much of the money she had accumulated from her trading endeavors into Islam's mission, including providing the ransom for Muslim slaves and feeding the Muslim community. She bequeathed her worldly goods and put herself in the face of danger to stand by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as Islam became established in the land. In addition to her business acumen and profile, when women were not encouraged to be visible, Khadija shows that, that character and humanitarianism can also be the foundations of status and respect. Now back to the first original question, women of Islam are incredibly resourceful and influential. How do we take that legacy and execute that tradition in the 21st century? The ethos of Islam is equality between the sexes, said the first Muslim woman, Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto of Pakistan. She delivered this line while giving her speech during her second government at the fourth UN World Conference on Women in Beijing in 1995, arguing that women's equity and empowerment are a central part of Islam. We don't challenge the international perceptions of Islam linking its roots to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and therefore to the first woman of Islam, Khadija. As the elected woman prime minister of a great Muslim country, it's a testament to the commitment of Islam to the role of women in society. It's, the tra it's this tradition of Islam that has empowered me, has strengthened me, has emboldened me, it was this heritage that sustained me during the most difficult points in my life. For Islam forbids injustice, injustice against people, against nations, against women. She goes on to say it denounces inequality as the gravest form of injustice. It enjoins its followers to combat oppression and tyranny. It enshrines pity as the sole criteria for judging humankind. It shines race, color, and gender as a basis of distinction amongst fellow men. Bido said that Islam codified the rights of women. When the human spirit were, was immersed in the darkness of the Middle Ages, Islam proclaimed equality between men and women. Islam gave women respect and dignity. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, of Islam, accepted them as equal partners. Benazir Bhutto was in her 20s when she became the leader of the Pakistan People's Party after her father's execution. In Pakistan's fragile democracy, for a woman to win, promising liberal, social, political, and economic reform was remarkable. Even after Bhutto's untimely death in 2007, when she was assassinated, her legacy stemming from the legacy of the first woman of Islam, Khadija, lives on. Fast track to July 2013, 16 year old Malala Yousafzai, a teenage figure on the world stage, gave a speech to the United Nations, honored to be wearing Benazir Bhutto's pale pink shawl, describing Bhutto as one of her inspirations. Campaigning for free, compulsory education for all over the world for every child, Malala said Islam is a religion of peace humanity and brotherhood. Islam says that it's not only it's a child's right to get education, rather it's their duty and responsibility. Both Benazir Bhutto and Malala Yousafzai, modern women of Islam, carried Khadija's ancient legacy of female empowerment into the 21st century. And now to my final questions, as women, who are we in terms of Khadija? I talked about the four pillars of Khadija earlier, which were the, the serial entrepreneur, the social disruptor and feminist, the first women of Islam and the humanitarian. For me, when I ask myself, who am I in terms of Khadija? I, took, um, I looked to those multiple layers of Khadija's identity and most of those pillars resonated strongly within me. As a leader of one of Australia's largest refugee resettlement programs at SSI, I certainly see myself as a humanitarian. At SSI, diversity and inclusion are embedded in all aspects of our work. The legacy of Khadija is inherent to our DNA. While supporting newly arrived communities, we also work with people with disabilities, people experiencing homelessness, 
people seeking employment, young people, children in foster care, and many more. Much of this work requires a philanthropic mission with a heart, but it also requires strategic thinking and innovation. Like Khadija, he expressed her entrepreneurial spirit in building her merchant business empire across the Arabian Peninsula and funneling the profits back into helping others. My work at SSI has the same concern for community well-being. I want to end with a moment of reflection where you ask yourself, if you haven't already, who are you in terms of Khadija? I am sure that her legacy and multiple pillars of identity resonate with you as much as they do with me. I hope you enjoyed my presentation and come away from today with a new appreciation of the rich legacy that is Khadija and the women of Islam. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yamama. Thank you very much. Um, I find that really fascinating, the way that all of us, no matter what our faith tradition, can relate to the women that you're talking about, um, you know, and can be empowered by the women that you're talking about. I love that idea of trying to be um, a social entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, a social distributor, a feminist, you know, leaders in our faith traditions and a humanitarian. And I think that's something we all aspire to. And I think that's one of the special things about the Abraham Conference and the relationship between the people of the book is that we can all learn so much from each other and can be enriched by those role models within other traditions. Um, can I ask, ask you, um, one question I've, I've written down so many here but there are lots of words that came up there um about Khadija you know strong-willed independent challenging social norms challenging the status quo being a social disrupt disruptor um and obviously she came from a position in some ways where she wasn't entirely self-made she was able to to build on the family business which she obviously she did and they, you wouldn't take that away from her but I, I'm, I'm wondering here with, with some of these strong role models how, how can those with similar sort of strong characteristics people who are empowered people who believe in their own agency how can they bring along other women in the 21st century in an Australian context but also internationally and we might want to think about places like Afghanistan where many women at the moment feel abandoned Thank you, Jane. It's a, it's a great question, and it's really important for all of us to think about that, not in terms of any religion, in terms of the humanitarian nature of um, and, and women empowerment and leadership. Um, for every woman who is empowered, who is strong and determined, how can we um, make sure that we empower other women? And, uh, and we can all do that even by... Um, you know, mentoring other women uh, who are, you know, who are um, a great model in in um, in their own rights too. Um, you know, so uh, programs in terms of mentoring uh, girls and women and strong um, leadership uh, programs. You know, supporting um, like I don't see a lot of profiling for. Um, women in different religions, uh, religious, like you know, um, in 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 the community or um, in the different religions as well, it, like what Khadija did in um, you know many many years ago in terms of empowering girls, in terms of supporting girls to marry and paying for them and um, sponsoring orphans and so on. If we can take some of this and trying to um, embed it in what we do in a day to day we can help a lot of girls. Um, if we can focus on girls' education and women education too, um, I mean, any war or anything, you can take anything from people, but the one thing that you can take away is education. And if they have the foundation of education, that will support them wherever they go, if they leave their countries or if they uh, move from because of war or because of violence, even family violence or anything, if they have the foundation, they can strive later. I don't want to hijack the conversation and make it all about Afghanistan, but I think it has been forefront in many of our minds, particularly when we think about women's rights. 
what, what do you think that that Muslim women in Australia or in the UK, which is where I'm from originally, or U- Europe or the US or, you know, those of us who have, you know, greater freedoms and rights, how do you think that we can use the responsibilities that come with those rights to protect the rights and freedoms of women in places like Afghanistan, which is obviously an extreme in a way at the moment of, of, of patriarchy. Um, what, do, what do you think that Muslim women and we all more broadly can do? For the women of Afghanistan, it's been um, devastating, um, for, not just for them, for all of us watching what's happening in Afghanistan um, and watching and bearing witnesses to um, the, uh, you know, the resilient, strong women who, who are losing hope after 20 years of uh, war against terror uh, to um, find that, you know, lose hope again that they can't get education or can't be employed or can't be equal partners there it's really devastating so i think um, continued advocacy raising the profile talking about the issues and supporting those women by sponsoring them by giving them opportunities to um to prove themselves um i know from the, my work at ssi and we're supporting some of the afghan evacuees who arrived so many of them are highly qualified how do we support them to um, basically um, uh, talk about their issues and support their fellow women in, is, who are still in Afghanistan? Um, it's, uh, it, there's a lot to be done uh, from everywhere. And I, I call on, on the world, actually, not to forget about the women of Afghanistan. Well, a lot of people in Afghanistan, but in particular women who will be um, suffering the most. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, Yamama. Could I invite now back... Uh, Jackie and Michelle to join the conversation. Um, we are running a little over time, um, so it's just coming up to four o'clock now. Um, and we were thinking of wrapping at four, but we've had some interesting questions coming in. Um, I don't want all the questions to have been mine. Um, so, so perhaps I should say to everybody, to say to our, our wider audience, if you feel that you need to leave now, please don't feel that you have to stay, but please also feel welcome if we run on for another five or 10 minutes longer. Um, and, and do please, you know, put up, put up your questions. Um, maybe um, Michelle and Yamama, I'm just trying to see if I can see you all. Yes, I can, you're in my top line, great. Um, one of the questions that has, has come up is, how do women achieve acceptance? Um, even within our own gender? Do we have to be more overt, which is something obviously we've all just been talking about? Do we have to expect acceptance? Do we have to demand acceptance? And, and I guess the extension of acceptance is, is agency and leadership. Um, and, and what do you think that might do to the, the traditional male-female relationships? Um, Jackie, perhaps I should go to you first. Oh, okay. Sorry, I thought I thought it was directed to the others. Um, uh, I I like to think that we can be accepted by being people, and that by being ourselves, that we that we have the the support from our religious traditions and our social support networks, if you like, around us, to be the people we are, regardless of gender and to offer up our thoughts and our commitments and our efforts to be accepted for what they are. I don't like the idea that women have to present differently in order to be acceptable. We might need to find the funding to also be able to put our ideas forward or to put our ideas into the mix more, do you think? Um, well, th- that's th- that's on a, on a, what I've just said is really about an interpersonal level. I think... I think um, what the two women whose stories I chose show me are that to get new ideas accepted and reform accepted and change accepted, we need to understand the systems in which we're working and have the language of those systems and the skills of those systems and, and the knowledge that is important in those systems to be able to challenge and to be able to get new, new ideas heard and understood. Uh, and and you, you asked me to think about, about women who have caused change and who are sort of the the... the the people who've caused the change in the last century that I spoke about earlier, and there's there's a whole range of just just to pick 
to pick a few. So there was a woman called Sarah Schneer in Poland in the 1920s who pioneered the idea of serious religious education for girls, which really was part of changing the face of education for girls and women. She, um, her thinking was, was followed and, and dovetailed with the thinking, and you asked me to talk about men as well as women, of the late Lubavitcher Rebbe, who was born in Russia, but who's, who was in America for most of his, his tenure and, and his work. Um, and from the 1940s on was also promoting serious religious education for women that would give them the tools to be functional and powerful um, in, in their environment. So, so that's, that's one angle, if you like. They, they understood and they could argue from a position of textual um, authority and confidence and using the language of those around them to make these new ideas take and take shape. Yeah. And, and Michelle, that was something that you were talking about too, wasn't it? It was something actually everybody's been talking about, the, the centrality of education for all mm -hmm. and the education around women's rights and the expectations that women should have around their own contribution. Uh, yes, Jane, uh, for sure, and I support everything Jackie just said. Um, I didn't highlight as much as I'd like to, uh, but I found it very interesting that um, the when the women who went to a conference in Sydney went from Wagga up to Sydney, and what they said was, so many gifted women. I'd, I, I would like to say two things you know, as well as what Jackie has said. One is I do think women themselves have to counteract um, um, a message that certainly I know I internalised as just a person growing up in Australian society. Uh, perhaps it was, you know, stronger in the, you know, the ancient times in which I grew up, but I really internalised that if you wanted anything uh, proper, like, for example, in academic work, if I had to reach, re read a scholar, or even if I had to think about who's a musician who really plays, I like, I like classical music. I would always just immediately think it was a man who, who was the authority. If I had to pick two books off a shelf and one was a woman and one was a man, I'd take the man. If I had to listen to a musician, I would always prefer the male because something told me they were authoritative. It has been a deliberate effort on my part to counteract that internalization. And I do think that is something that women need to do so that we need to, we need to counteract that. And the way to do that is to actually focus on women and recognise the ability of women. Um, in very practical terms, uh, you know, uh, very, very often, uh, the female voice <coughs> is simply not heard. I'm sure we've all had experiences of being at a meeting where a female person says something and it, nothing happens. And then a male person repeats it. And, oh, most of the people, you know, particularly people of that gender at the meeting say, oh, oh, yes, all right, that's a good idea. Uh, and I think very, very many women have had the experience of wanting to say, I just said that. So there is something, there is something inaudible about the female voice, I think, still. And that's why I mentioned the social imaginary. I think the only way to get it into the imaginary is uh, for it to be heard more, witness what, uh, you know, the Abraham uh, Tradition uh, Conference is doing this very day. So congratulations to you for being brave enough to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we, we need to grow in hearing a conversation that actually hears male and female voices, each of which is recognised as being of substance and having gravity. Well, we've had a really interesting um, comment from the chat. I'm not quite sure who it's from because Patrick and Linda are very kindly um, collating questions for me. But it says here, I particularly agree with the concept of educating women about their rights and responsibilities in Islam, as well as the rights and responsibilities of men in Islam to ensure social balance. Now, I'm sure that also extends to the Catholic Church, the different Christian traditions and to Judaism. Um, but the, the point this... Um, gentleman or perhaps lady has gone on to say is the lack of this education has given power to the patriarchal world that unfortunately is what causes spiritual abuse and I think that's a interesting contribution from our audience so thank you for that. Um, Yamama do you want to add anything to, to this particular point? Uh, I think Michelle and uh, Jackie covered really well but I'll also add that um, it's um, all what you mentioned um, 
uh, as well, Jane, it's, uh, it's education, it's uh, being avert and demanding at the same time, because, um, you know, when we have people linking some sort of abuses or treatment to religion, um, as I mentioned earlier about the Islamic religion, Islam has given a lot of respect to women and their contribution. So it's not a religious thing to uh, undermine women's rights and their contribution. So how do we, we, we make sure that we educate people more on this? And also uh, if uh, we're talking about um, life and work and community, if, uh, if people are not um, respecting the role and contribution of women, we really, as women, as strong-willed strong -willed women, we need to be afraid about it and we need to demand it. Thank you. Can, can I just ask our three speakers, Jackie, Michelle um, and Yamama, are you happy to stay on for one or two more questions? Because it's now um, six minutes past four. Um, and I know that, that there were time commitments and we, we were planning to finish at four o'clock, but I don't want to kind of deprive anybody of, of being able to put their question into the mix. Yes, that's fine. Happy to, to field one more question. Absolutely. Um, and perhaps I could, could put the same question to, to each of you. I'll start again with Jackie. So we'll work from, from the top as it were, but Jackie, could you share with us what the, something about the role of women rabbis in our world today? Sure. Um, so uh, that's one of the areas where there's been massive change in Judaism because, uh, well, Many people will be, will be aware that there's different strands of Judaism in the, in the contemporary world, um, what we call orthodoxy, which has its own many strands, reform, progressive, conservative, um, numbers of different approaches theologically and ritually. Um, and the, the more progressive of those movements started to give women religious authority and ordain women um, in the 1930s, so the first woman rabbi was in fact a woman called Regina Jonas in Germany who unfortunately died at the hands of the Nazis. Um, but she was the first woman rabbi and she was from the reform movement. It was a long time coming before um, moving toward uh, along the orthodox spectrum that, that women could become rabbis in orthodoxy. Um, and so uh, you asked me to call out, you know, both women and, and, and men who supported them. So Along the way, I think we have to call out other changes in women's participation in religious ritual. So Rabbi Mordechai Kaplan, who was the rabbi of the Reconstructionist Movement in America, his daughter, Judith Kaplan, had the first recorded bat mitzvah. So um, uh, in the 1920s in America, the first um, celebration of a, of a girl coming of age in the same way that a boy's was celebrated. Um, but that was in the progressive movement. It wasn't until probably the 1970s that orthodoxy started also celebrating bat mitzvah in a way that was similar to the way boys celebrated bar mitzvah. So you see that development happening over the course of the 20th century um, and ac across the course of the 20th century. So women reform rabbis started being actually influential in the movement. So they were given, they were given the ability to be ordained from the 1930s, as I said, but what was interesting was that sociologically there was still enough sexism, even in the communities that, theoretically allowed them to participate as religious authorities, that they don't really become really influential until probably the 1970s, 1980s, by which time the conservative movement started to ordain women as well. So women become um, important uh, rabbinical authorities probably in the 1990s in the conservative movement. Um, and then and there's, some, there's a whole lot of people who are involved in the change to civil and religious authority in, the, in orthodoxy and I, I want to name here Blue Greenberg, who's an amazing woman who's been um, an advocate in, in the USA since the 1980s. Um, scholars and theologians like Nechama Leibovitz and Dr. Tamar Ross in, um, in Israel, who are current, current theologians. Um, so one of the questions that came through um, that was sent to me was, um, how would I link what Michelle said um, about the wonderful contemporary work done by a young um, Filipina Catholic theologian now. So I would link her more, not to, the, not to the women that I talked about historically, but to the work of Dr. Tamar Ross. So they lay the groundwork for, um, in, in very recent times, only the last 15 years, orthodoxy beginning to ordain women as well. 
um, and there um, a rabbi called Avi Weiss um, and his first graduate, Rabbi Sarah Hurwitz in New York, um, have to be called out as the pioneers. And I'm delighted to say that my, my dear friend and former colleague, Robin Judy Leviton, was last year ordained as the first Orthodox female rabbi in Sydney. Um, and that's, it's a huge, huge change, one that I did not think would happen in my lifetime. Um, and what we're seeing is that exponentially these scholars and religious leaders who are women are starting to have an impact on what is taught, what is written, what is learnt, the role models that they provide for young women and men and for the little girls as well, the, the ideas, the way that the religious world opens up to think more creatively, more innovatively, and be able to respond better to the needs of its people. It's, it's extraordinary and, and I feel very grateful to be alive to see it happen. Great, thank, thank you, thank you. Michelle, can I, could I go to you next? I'm going to ask you to, to sort of keep your answer relatively short, but you, you have anyway been telling us about a group of role models um, and, and two individuals from the 21st century. But so, so we're, we're seeing the roles that women are playing in the church because you described some of those, but perhaps you might just want to add one sentence as to what some of the barriers are to a further extension of those roles and to more formalized roles within the church and how may, might they be overcome if you can do that quickly. Uh, in the Catholic Church, all authority is really, it's, it's called hierarchical and it's priestly and really all final authority rests in the hands of ordained priests who in our tradition to this point in time have been 99.9999% male. Uh, Pope Francis is trying to make changes where, where some parts of that authority are, a, a women are becoming involved. Really, there needs to be, a, as I say, a change to the social imaginary that this is possible. It's a slow process. Uh, I think it is underway. Um, and, uh, you know, women have to uh, press it wherever possible. Um, but respecting the tradition in which we find ourselves. Thank you. And, and Yamama, perhaps you could, you could just wrap up for us. I, I know that there are some female imams or sheikhs coming forward. I don't know to what extent they're kind of driving their own progress, if you like, and to what extent there is room being made for them by the, the men within the, um, the hierarchy. Thank you, Jane. There's, uh, we still have a long way to go. There's uh, a, a lot of progress in this uh, uh, area, but um, yes, I think we're still um, a long way um, to go. Um, but, you know, the expectation is, uh, you know, some of, um, of it is more a, of cultural expectations than actual religions, and that's what we need to keep highlighting and, and going back to that. If uh, people are referring to religions, it's actually not. Um, it's it's uh, we need to shift the cultural expectations, and and move forward. Right. Th th thank you very much, and thank you to the three of you. I'm going to hand over to Father Patrick in a moment, but I suppose I'd just like to add my own small reflection, which is that we as women in this webinar today, and I'm sure there are a lot of women in the audience, we, we need as far as we can to, to take the power into our own hands. It's not always easy. We need to take it for ourselves and we need to take it for others. Um, and we need to, to carve out a way forward, looking back to the, the role models and sideways at the role models who are our contemporaries for inspiration. And, and for agency. And I, and I would ask, as I'm sure all the other women would do too, that, that the men in the audience today, you know, stand with us and alongside us or lead the charge on that because it's hard for women to do it alone after centuries of, of um, walking several paces behind. So thank, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this this afternoon. I'd just like to hand over now to Father Patrick to wrap up. Thank you, Jane. With apologies, I am a bloke, a male, who has the final word. <laughs> As chair of the Abraham Conference Organising Committee, and on behalf of the many people from Sydney, New South Wales, other cities and states in Australia, and even internationally, who have participated in this online conference, it is my privilege to thank all of those involved in presenting today's 
very important interfaith conversation. At the outset, I acknowledge that the title Abraham Conference is shorthand. The preamble to our terms of reference reads, Jews, Christians, and Muslims all acknowledge the patriarch Abraham, as well as the matriarchs Sarah and Hagar as foundational to their respective faiths. Properly speaking, we are the Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar conference. But that's too many words for social media. I thank Auntie Shirley Gilbert for giving us the acknowledgement and welcome to country as part of the heritage that we inherit from the First Nations peoples of Australia. Today's theme, women leaders in the Abrahamic traditions, role models for our time, is very important. There is no one attending this seminar who is not born of a woman. More than half of our society is made up of girls and women. Yet too often our society, and despite their high ideals, sometimes even our religions, condone patriarchy, misogyny, inequity, and violence against women. I thank our three speakers who have opened their respective faith traditions and shown us a different way. Jackie has spoken about Deborah as a fiery woman of valor and Baruria as a woman of authority. Michelle has spoken of the social imagination of creating a different vision of how we can be together and relate with each other. And your mama has spoken of Khadija as her model and example that inspires her work in her work of helping and transforming society according to the best possible ideals. I thank also our moderator, Jane Jeffs, who's conducted the conference with passion, interest and flair. I thank the New South Wales Jewish Board of Deputies and their technical staff who hosted the Zoom conference. I thank my colleagues in the Abraham Conference Organizing Committee for together overcoming many obstacles in our year-long planning and preparation for this conference. And finally, I thank all of you, the online participants. You have encouraged us by giving us your precious time on a Sunday afternoon. I hope that in return, you have found inspiration and commitment to make a difference in enabling, encouraging, and ensuring the God-given equal dignity of women and men for all times and places, in our families, in our religious communities, in our workplaces, and in our societies. May Jews, Christians, and Muslims together serve justice and the common good especially for the poor and the vulnerable. And may we all meet again next year to continue our interfaith relations, hopefully face to face. Thank you and God bless. Thank you.